It is rare in the study of prehistory to find direct genomic windows into the lives of people who walked the earth tens of millennia ago, but new research has done exactly that. Scientists have now sequenced the oldest high-coverage modern human genomes ever recovered from Europe. Individuals who lived nearly 50,000 years ago at sites in Ranis in Germany and Slaty Kuhn in Czechia. These people were among the very first modern humans to push deep into the continent, entering a land still dominated by Neanderthals and adapting to an unforgiving Ice Age climate. The genetic and archaeological findings link these individuals into a single, small, closely related population. Some were even biologically related within the group, including a mother and daughter, and more distant kin. These early Europeans, part of what geneticists call the deepest known split from the main lineage, offer a rare chance to understand not only their DNA, but their tools, hunting strategies, and the harsh environment they called home. Although unlike the drawings released in the press release, they likely were not walking around barefoot in the freezing tundra. Though their ancestors likely had already spent 50,000 years in Arabia before moving north so they were biologically adapted to a colder environment. The Ranis and Zlatikun genomes tell us that this was a population of only a few hundred individuals at most, dispersed over a large territory. They had split early from the main population of modern humans that migrated into Eurasia, yet they still carried the same Neanderthal DNA segments found in all Eurasians today. This shared Neanderthal ancestry came from a single admixture event dated to around 45,000 to 49,000 years ago, shortly before their occupation of Central Europe. So this is remarkable that that admixture happened so recent, so it could have happened in Central Europe or in the Middle East. Importantly, this timing is later than previously believed. It suggests that the ancestors of all Eurasians alive today were still part of a single population at that time, before dispersing further across Eurasia. It also implies that any human remains older than 50,000 years in Western Eurasia, such as some from the Levant or Asia, probably represent groups that were not ancestral to later Eurasians. Within the Rani's group, DNA sequencing revealed close family links. The discovery of a mother and her daughter in the cave is extraordinary. Finding immediate kin in the Pleistocene record is exceptionally rare. These people were not an amorphous crowd of unrelated wanderers, but a network of families moving together and maintaining contact. Even more striking, the Zlati Kun woman, found over 200 kilometers, 125 miles away in Czechia, was a fifth or sixth degree relative of two Ranis individuals. That connection suggests mobility and long-range social networks, even in a world of small population size. Phenotypic genetic markers indicate that these early modern Europeans likely had dark skin and hair with brown eyes. This is consistent with a recent Eurasian origin. Lighter skin would only evolve later in European populations, probably under the influence of reduced ultraviolet light and dietary changes. The Ranis and Zlati Kun individuals carried no signs of recent Neanderthal admixture beyond the shared ancient segments, meaning that by the time they were living in Europe, their immediate ancestors had not interbred with Neanderthals in the preceding generations. Archaeologically, these humans are firmly linked to a distinctive stone tool tradition known as the Lincombian Ranesian Jers Manowishan, or LRJ. This techno complex spans northwestern and central Europe and has long puzzled archaeologists because it shows traits reminiscent of both middle and upper Paleolithic technologies. The LRJ includes finely flaked, leaf-shaped points, Jersmanowicz points, and other bifacially worked tools often made on long blades. At Ranis, most of these tools were napped from Baltic flint, indicating that raw material was procured or traded over considerable distances. A few pieces of quartzite were also present, suggesting flexible use of locally available stone. The LRJ appears to have been used for hunting weapons, likely hafted as spear tips as well as cutting and scraping tools for processing meat, hides and wood. Although leaf points are often associated with Neanderthals at some sites, the direct association of LRJ tools with Homo sapiens bones at Ranis resolves the question for this site. These were made by modern humans. 
Zooarchaeological and proteomic analysis of the Rani's faunal assemblage shows a clear preference for large Ice Age herbivores. Reindeer were the most common prey, supplemented by horse, bison and woolly rhinoceros. Cave bears were abundant in the bone record, but most of their remains were not the result of human hunting. They were denning or hibernating in the cave, and their carcasses were often left to scavengers such as hyenas. The cut-mark bones that do exist show that humans occasionally butchered animals on site. Butchery intensity was relatively low. This, together with the low density of artifacts in many layers, suggests that the site was used intermittently, probably as a short-term hunting camp. The isotope signatures from human collagen indicate a diet almost entirely composed of terrestrial animal protein, with no detectable contribution from fish or plants. These were highly mobile hunters, moving across a steppe tundra landscape and targeting migratory herds. One of the most important contributions from the Rani's excavations is the detailed reconstruction of the climate between 49,000 and 42,000 years ago. Stable isotope measurements from horse teeth and other fauna show that the period of main human occupation around 45,000 to 43,000 years ago coincided with an exceptionally cold phase. Mean annual temperatures dropped sharply at this time, with winters particularly severe. Oxygen isotope values indicate that winters were not only cold but also dry, and nitrogen isotopes point to open, treeless steppe environments dominated by grasses. This was not a temporary cold snap. Conditions remained severe throughout the occupation, yet modern humans persisted there. Their presence during such harsh conditions challenges the old idea that early expansions into Europe were tied only to warm climate windows. Seasonal movement patterns are harder to reconstruct, but strontium isotopes suggest that at least some of the horses, and by extension perhaps the hunters following them, remained within relatively small home ranges, while others may have travelled more widely. This mobility may have been part of a hunting strategy, with human groups intercepting migrating game. The archaeological evidence shows that Ranis was not a permanent settlement. Instead, it was visited periodically, perhaps seasonally, by small groups of modern humans. The low density of artifacts and butchered bones, combined with the high proportion of carnivore remains, suggests that humans were only one of several large predators using the cave. Hyenas, wolves and other carnivores also left their marks on the bones. Layer 8, which contains the most human remains, shows the highest density of both lithics and faunal material from human activity. Other layers with human presence appear to reflect shorter visits. This pattern suggests a landscape in which groups moved frequently, establishing short-term hunting or processing camps at strategic points along migration routes of large herbivores. Genetic analysis indicates that the Rani Zlati Kun population was small and isolated. With an effective population size of only a few hundred individuals, they may have been vulnerable to demographic fluctuations and environmental stresses. The absence of genetic continuity between them and later Europeans suggests that this early incursion into Northern Europe ultimately failed to establish a lasting lineage. There are several possible reasons for this. One is that subsequent waves of modern humans carrying slightly different genetic profiles may have replaced or absorbed them without leaving a detectable genetic trace. Another is that small, scattered groups were more prone to local extinction, especially under Ice Age climatic instability. Although Rannis humans lived in a Europe still inhabited by Neanderthals, their genomes show no evidence of recent Neanderthal admixture beyond the earlier shared event. This is a contrast to other early modern humans, such as those from Bachokiro Cave in Bulgaria, who do show signs of having Neanderthal ancestors only a few generations back. One interpretation is that the Rani's group entered Europe by a different route, perhaps avoiding regions with dense Neanderthal populations, or that their forays into Neanderthal territory were brief and limited. Another is that social or cultural factors constrained interbreeding even when contact occurred. The LRJ toolkit shows that these early Europeans were technologically flexible. They could work high-quality flint from distant sources, shape befacial points with skill, and use multiple raw materials depending on availability. This adaptability would have been vital in a landscape where resources were patchy and seasonal. 
The combination of middle Paleolithic-like bifacial forms and upper Paleolithic blade technology suggests that LRJ toolmakers were experimenting, perhaps adapting older technological traditions to new environments and prey. It also hints at possible cultural exchanges with Neanderthals, who in some areas were producing their own leafpoint industries. Living in the steppe tundra of Ice Age Central Europe required more than hunting skill. Clothing from animal hides would have been essential, as would shelters that could withstand freezing winds. Although no textiles or structures survive at Rannis, ethnographic analogy and archaeological evidence from later periods suggest that hide-covered frames, windbreaks, and the use of caves for shelter would have been part of their survival toolkit. Fire was crucial not only for warmth, but for cooking and protection from predators. The charred plant material identified in the sediments provides direct evidence that these humans were burning wood inside the cave. Given the treeless nature of the landscape, this fuel may have come from driftwood, shrubs, or limited stands of trees along river valleys. The Ranis and Zlati Kun genomes show that the initial push of Homo sapiens into the heart of Europe occurred earlier and under more severe conditions than once thought. These were not simply warm phase opportunists, but pioneers capable of surviving in full Ice Age environments. However, their disappearance from the genetic record of later Europeans serves as a reminder that early expansions were not always permanent. Some pioneering groups may have been replaced by later waves of migration perhaps with technological or social advantages that allowed them to flourish where earlier ones did not. The sequencing of 50,000-year-old modern human genomes from Europe opens a vivid window into a vanished world. At Ranis and Slati Kun, we see a small, mobile, closely related population of dark-skinned hunters moving through a frozen steppe, carrying remarkable well-crafted leaf-shaped spear points, reminiscent of Salutrian or Clovis spear points, and the memory of an ancient Neanderthal encounter in their DNA. They hunted reindeer and horse, lit fires in caves shared with bears and hyenas, and endured some of the coldest winters of the late Pleistocene. Their genetic ties stretched hundreds of kilometres, linking mother and child, cousins and distant kin across the harsh landscapes of Ice Age Europe. For a time, they were the northernmost edge of our species' expansion, a human outpost in Neanderthal lands. Then they vanished, leaving behind only their bones, their tools, and now, thanks to the power of ancient DNA, their genomes speaking across fifty millennia to tell us who they were, where they came from, and how they lived.